Emily Gaudreau, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here with us on the Get Foxy Show. Who said I had a busy schedule? <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm glad to be here. You're very welcome. You have a lot going on as far as running your website, how to raise a maverick.com. Yep. And I wanted to have you on the show because you have such an important story and you've got a mission regarding the safety of our kids. So I'd like to start this off just by asking you about your background and how did you start getting into this work about really stopping sexual abuse? Yeah, so everybody wants to know I have a I was a commercial photographer, commercial editorial advertising photographer for years. And um, I worked at Playboy for a period of time. I worked for Rachel Ray. I worked for Bill Gates um, at Bungie Studios. I, uh, I've been to 35 different countries kind of doing documentary work, really just cool, fun stuff. And um, in 2008, when I was uh, working with Playboy, I had a, kind of a just a moment where I realized that I was continuing the victimization of some of the models there. It was just a just just a it was just a flash of my brain going, "Whoa, this is this is not right. This is not cool." Um, and it's kind of snowballed since then. Um, I've had a series of people that are close to me, their friends. I mean, there's everybody, I'm sure everybody listening, you guys have got stories, you've heard stories, stuff has happened in your family, um, where you kind of go, when is this going to stop? Who's, who, who's, <laughs> Who's going to change change this? It's it's headed in the speaking of the child sexual abuse. It's headed in a really bad direction very quickly. Um, I mean, the stats are from one one to five. I even heard one in four girls are sexually abused um, by the time they're eighteen. It's just insane. It's insane. So um, one of my really good friends, as a child, was uh, sexually abused by her mother. And um, I often think back about that. And that really is the full catalyst for what I do because neither her or I had any idea that what she was going through was wrong. There's a fly in the room, guys. So if it lands on my face, do not laugh. <laughs> if it flies up my nose or anything like that. So, um, yeah, she, it, I, I think back to that time where I'm with my friend and we, it's, it was like from, I was spending a lot of time with her and, and like I would go over to her house, even my parents would send me over, nothing ever happened to me, um, but from second grade on, from, from second to sixth grade, um, her mom was doing stuff to her and telling her that this is, this is what we do when you're of age, this is totally normal. And she would tell me these stories and I was like, oh. You know, I wasn't developed enough to have that happening to me. You know, I was essentially being groomed through her, thinking that this is what happens. This is what we do. We didn't know any better. Nobody had said anything. Nobody said that nobody should be touching your private parts or doing various other things, you know? So uh, my goal is to really make sure that doesn't happen to anybody else, that kids get the information, parents get the information, um, and have an easy way of delivering the information. So none of this happens to anybody ever again. And I know that's a huge, that's a huge mission, but somebody has got to do it. So that, that is a huge, yes, uh, huge. gargantuan <laughs> mission. Yeah. What was the catalyst that really felt like you may, well, made you decide you needed to take on this job because I mean there's a lot of us that kind of get exposed to these sort of things but we don't decide 
yeah, I'm, I'm going to be the one to step up and, and start the fight on this. So this one is, it's, it's interesting. It's, um, I call it a God thing or, I mean, you could have higher power, um, you know, whatever, whatever your language is around that, but mine is, is definitely God. And I was going through a period of time where I had my daughter, I was at home, um, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, so I wasn't, you know, I was really sick, and um, I had all these kind of, um, it was pretty serious, life-changing things happen, and I was like, God, but like, what, God, higher power, like, what do I do? Where, what am I supposed to be doing? Um, and um, I, I meditated on it, I prayed on it. And then I had a moment, I had a very specific moment, I was in the bathtub, and it's funny because I hear a lot of people have these moments in water, and there's something with, I don't know if it's the stillness, or you're just quiet, you know, you, you're hopefully not watching TV, or you don't have your phone in there, if you're just quiet, you know, you get spoken to more often than you're not listening. <laughs> and uh, I was told to do this. And I said, no, no way. There's no way I am doing that. I am not a therapist. I am not a counselor. Um, I do not have the physical bandwidth. You know, I don't have the emotional bandwidth. That is not me. I'm not doing it. Me. And um, when you ask and then you, it, tells you, <laughs> it tells you what you should be doing and you don't answer, um, it just doesn't go away. So I, I just kept getting that. And um, what I realized was, and it took a long time, is I have an advertising marketing translation. I call it a translation skill. So I have the ability to get information. And this is what we would do in the advertising world. People want something said. And as an artist working in that, I would translate it into a way that people could understand, feel like they were a part of it, get the information and kind of essentially buy into it. And this is something that most therapists don't have. I have marketing ability. I have the ability to motivate people to take action. And the other odd thing that I didn't skill, I didn't know I have, I have a massive bandwidth for processing trauma. So not necessarily my trauma, but people can tell me stories. I can hear things. And there's something called secondary trauma, which a lot of people hear somebody else's trauma and they internalize it and they become traumatized by it. And a lot of therapists um, have to deal with this when they first start hearing like when I'm working with one-on-one -on -one cases um, and they have X amount of green, they call it like a green space. I have a massive bandwidth for hearing stories. And part of it is I intellectualize it and I am processing and filing away and researching and figuring out how I can use it to help people. This thing happened. I've heard X amount happen. I, you know, I have my spreadsheets of, um, things that are reoccurring themes and people's stories that need to be addressed because as we know technology is changing quicker and quicker and a lot of the abuse and ways kids are being groomed changes as that technology changes so um, yeah that's that's kind of how it happened I was told to do it and then I kind of gave in and I realized like oh I'm, I'm the missing piece between people who are in the trenches, like say trying to save the brains of people who were traumatized. And there needs to be some people stopping it from happening in the first place. So then how did your website all, all come about then? Was that just something that immediately happened or was there a process that you went through? Well, um, how to Raise a Maverick is the podcast, and it's my sneaky way of um, having access. I mean, you know as well, when you have somebody on your show, I can get access to therapists and experts that um, I wouldn't be able to just as a, a regular person. So I use it as a passport to get experts to inform me. And I also use it as, it's a general parenting podcast to, um, 
drop truth bombs about sex abuse prevention. Um, so that's my, I try and get interesting parenting. It's on the scheme of how to raise a maverick is to raise kids with work ethic, grit, empathy, and curiosity. And a lot of that stemmed from, I was like, what do we need our kids to be it, to not become these type of people who are buying child pornography or trafficking babies and like, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine like, like what skill set can we empower our kids to not fall into that? And they need the, the grit to say, be in a situation and be like, no, I'm not going to participate. They need the work ethic to be socially, potentially socially ostracized for going, no, I'm not going to watch pornography. You know, I'm not going to be a part of this. Um, and they need empathy to look at something and go, wow, like that's not cool. Somebody's being hurt. Um, I can't imagine what it'd feel like to have that done to me. Um, and curiosity is another one too, is like, why are we doing this? What is this benefiting? Where is this going? How does this play out? Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my, my podcast, my website, and I have online courses. Um, and I, I teach sex abuse prevention to parents on the course. That's fantastic. All kinds, uh, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> as, as you're speaking, uh, the, the message that I've heard in other circles is, well, pornography doesn't hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. And what I'm not in the, like, I've heard that too, not as, as an agreement. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, broke up there, Emily, for just, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, cool. Yeah, so the biggest thing about pornography not hurting, this is a common theme that people think that A, the people are there by um, consent. That's not necessarily a fact. There, You cannot, some of those people are voluntarily there. And um, like from working at Playboy, those people chose to be there. The other side of that coin is, um, I think the statistics crazy, like 90% of people who are sex workers were sexually abused as children. So, which is why I stopped doing the work that I was doing is it was, it's this continual victimization that happens. Yes, they're there by choice, but a choice that set a trajectory in their life was made for them a long time ago. And the message that their body is not theirs, it's for everybody and it's for public use was set a long time ago. You know, and that's what the difference between you go, why would somebody do that? Well, they don't believe that that's theirs. And I mean, some people are totally mentally healthy and um, they're there by choice. But the other part that's really disturbing about pornography is especially in the, with the sex trafficking, the link between sex trafficking and pornography is very strong. Um, a lot of girls who are trafficked are filmed and that's used as, um, that's sold as pornography. Also, some of those rape scenes that you see, those aren't acted out. Those are actual rape scenes um, of girls who potentially, maybe, maybe not, went voluntarily to be filmed but not particularly in that way. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I would say you'd have to ask yourself, you know, is it okay to voyeuristically? That's not the word. Be a voyeurist? I can't speak. I've had too much coffee today. To would it be morally okay with you to be in a room while somebody is being raped and masturbate? Because that's what's happening. It's you know, and there are, uh, there are websites that have ethical pornography. So that's one way to kind of go around that. But there's also the other problem is that it's very addictive. Um, and so there's the addiction piece that a lot, a lot of people seriously struggle with. And um, the biggest problem that I have with pornography is it has the ability to transform what was your authentic sexuality 
into a preference for something only pornography can provide. And that's usually with the collision of sexually arousing images with violence or, you know, the various other novelties that go on with it. And um, you can only get it through pornography. It's like the perfect gateway to them. You know, you, you'd have to do this illegal activity um, or sexually unhealthy activity or whatever to get what they're selling. Um, yeah, so I, I think that, um, I know a lot of you are moms that are listening and it's, it's very important, <laughs> one, you've got to lock down your devices. If, and two, if you've got older kids, um, if they have smartphones, if they are watching pornography, their friends are showing them pornography, it is definitely a very intrinsic part of their, their life. Um, one really good solution to that is the Gab phone. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but um, it's a wireless phone that the kids can take pictures, but they can't send them, which is very important for sexting. Uh, there, there's all kinds of blackmail issues that can happen with that. They can text um, and they can phone call, but they can't connect to the internet. It looks like a smartphone. You mentioned authentic sexuality yeah uh, how well first off let's let's kind of define that a little bit what do you what do you mean exactly by authentic sexuality and two how do you recommend that we kind of uh, cultivate this for our for our kids and ourselves yeah so one of the things, one of the things I'm a big proponent for is people and kids coming into coming into themselves and the human experience and relationships and sexuality without it being influenced by outside sources. And what that, that means is, if you if a child is sexually abused or if anybody is sexually abused, assaulted, there's been a transformation of their perception of who they are sexually. Um, pornography is absolutely uh, a sexual abuse within children. If you're exposed to pornography as a child, that is sexual abuse. Their sexuality has been transformed. So what happens is kids get online. There's something called sexual non-concordance. And Emily Nagowski talked about it in her book, Come As You Are. And it was researched it was a project that they did in Manchester Metropolitan University where they put sensors on people and they, they watched pornography and they buzzed whether or not they were aroused, whether they thought they were aroused by it. And the alignment of their physical arousal and their mental arousal was a 20% overlap for girls, for women, and 50% overlap for men. And this is very, very important for everyone to understand that your physical body response isn't a definition of who you are. The brain will see something, your eyes will see something that is sexual, anything that's sexual, and goes, okay, let's get ready for sex. That doesn't define you. <laughs> and it's not who you are. And it's not the direction you should be pointing um, your sexual desires towards you know you can start going down this rabbit hole of this is what i like because this is what turned me on um this is a real real uh challenge because who you are authentically sexually is one of the cool things that you kids people everybody gets to figure out in loving healthy committed relationships as they grow up and as soon as you have Pornography in, in kids' lives like this, it's very difficult to fit, unravel who they really are outside of that influence, if that makes any sense. So it's, it's not persuading them to be of one heterosexual or cisgender or anything like that. It's to give them the opportunity that if they're 
really into one thing, it's because they had this fun, cool experience with this other human being that loved them and they found this thing and they connected in that way. That's what it is. It's not like trying to conform them. We want them to be this way. They are going to be who they are. Everybody that has kids knows like you, kids are just going to be who they are, but we want them to find that themselves and it not being sold on some porn, porn site, you know? That makes absolute sense. It's, it's like, uh, we, we want them to have a, a clear idea about who they are. Yeah. Without the waters, tech, uh, without the waters being muddied, so to speak, right? By by these ideas put into their heads through the medium of pornography. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's difficult because we are so bombarded with so much information and so much choice about who we are. You know, we don't have those you know, with like my moment in the bathtub, just do quiet time, just turn the volume down for your kids. And if you can keep them away from the pornography as long as humanly possible, it's, it'll be a game changer for them. They will hate you. They'll hate you for something anyways, for a lot, for whatever. Um, and then someday they'll thank you, you know, just do whatever you can to keep your kids safe from pornography. How can people find your podcast, Emily? Um, if you just Google how to raise a maverick, it's on pretty much everywhere that you find podcasts these days. Um, and I do a uh, Young, Wild, and Safe course online, which I'm super proud of because it's, again, I'm a translator. So this is all the work that therapists have been doing for years, survivors, uh, forensic investigators, um, even sexual predators, convicted sexual predators who have shared information about how they have groomed children or what happens to kids. And I've created this way for parents to teach their kids how to keep them safe using analogies found in nature. So um, I would say one that I'd like to use that helps people understand that is, you know, the idea that we have to tell our kids that there's predators out there. Um, but how do you tell that to a three-year-old or a four-year-old or you know, even a seven-year-old? How do you break that innocence? So we just teach them the stalking, luring, and mimicking are the three tools that predators use. And with kids, with the littles, they're all about animals. They're in that animal world. That's what they know. That's kind of like it's more into that earth based. They're closer to the earth at that point. So you, you go to the zoo, you watch in the wild and you say, you know, look at the animal stalking the other one, the cat stalking the bird. It's low, it's watching, it's quiet, it's getting ready to attack. And the other one doesn't even know it's there. Luring, you know, we lure birds into the yard. I tell my daughter, you know, get something the dog wants and lure her into the house. Um, and mimicking is our mimicry, camouflage, anything like that. Animals pretending to be something they're not. And you just talk to them about that in the animal world, about those interesting things that they do. That's how predators work. You see that, see what they're doing. That's super interesting and super innocent vibes with them on so many levels. And then as they get older, you can say, you know how we talked about predators? Humans can be predators too. You can take them to Cabela's. You can look at the lures, the camouflage, you know, the bird calls, all that. Um, and then as they get older again, and they, they're online, this is what I love about this, is it works so perfectly for the internet, is predators stalk, lure, and mimic. You know, are they pretending to be something they're not? Could they be? Could they be mimicking something else? Are they luring you with something you really want? You want that modeling job, you want that sports gig, you know, you want that, you know, game trick or something like that. You want that girlfriend, you want to be popular, whatever. What are they trying to lure you with? Um, kind of as a, as a preemptive conversation for um, blackmail. So that's how I do it is I do these slow ramping conversations where it's just little drops you're not having the big talk and um, 
kind of tracks them where they're at and what they're interested in as they get older. That's fantastic. I mean, it, and it so relates to me having grown up in rural Wyoming. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it, it works out well, but uh, for for the for the urban children, well, it might take a little bit more work. But uh, I think that is an absolutely amazing way to go about it. Yeah. Switch things up a little bit here yeah. and ask you the question that I ask all my guests. Ooh. And that is, what does foxy and being foxy mean to Emily? Oh, um, foxy, gosh, it's to me, it's wild. My, I grew up in the mountains as well, and we had foxes that lived around us and occasionally would sneak into the house. Foxy's being smart and wild. And who would you say is foxy in your world? Ooh. Um, I, I think my, my daughter's probably the smartest wild person I know. She's leaning on the wild side. <laughs> but uh, foxes are sneaky and smart and... Um, and wild, yeah, that's my daughter all day long. And how do you kind of uh, go about cultivating that and, and helping her maintain that foxiness? <sighs> you know, my, my biggest challenge right now um, or thing that I'm focusing on is letting her be her. You know, we, um, she's, I call her a dark star. She loves, she's seven years old, but she wears, she's like literally a punk. She wears black all the time. Um, she is wild. She really is like um, wild. And just trying to not get like freaked out. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're like hitting this weird like emo stage and you're only seven, you know? Um, but trying not to project the, you know, who she is or what I, I think is going on there. Um, yeah, just trying to let her be her with also guiding her into um, how we fit into society. I have a saying called appear to conform. You know, there's rules that go on in society and you don't necessarily have to agree with them, but you have to appear to conform. You don't have to you don't have to drink the Kool-Aid. You just need to, to appear to follow these rules to get through these different social constructs. It doesn't mean totally buying in. Don't ever totally buy in. Um, always have one foot out. And um, just knowing how to navigate a complex world, but also be a sneaky little fox. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, Emily, if you can believe it, our time is just about up here. So if Ooh, you went quick. Would <laughs> share one more time with us how people can find you and learn more about the work that you do. Yeah, how to raise a maverick. And you'll find that Facebook, Instagram, and uh, you'll find my website. I've got some freebies. And if you are stuck in a situation with your kiddos, I'm a good person to help you um, work on that, especially around any of the sexual awkward stuff, what's going, what's normal sexual behavior, how to talk to them about pornography. Um, if you're thinking that something doesn't seem right and you don't quite know what to do about it, especially child and child, um, abuse is something I work with a lot because that can be a very, very tricky situation. And it happens a lot because kids see pornography. So, excellent. Well, ladies, you've heard it here. Check out Emily's website, howtoraiseamaverick.com, and listen to your intuition. And if you feel like Emily would be a good resource for her or for you, reach out to her. All right. Emily, thank you so much for taking the time. You are doing the world and an amazing service and I just honor you and bless you for doing the work that you're doing. Thank you. <laughs>